I'm Tracy Grimshaw. Welcome to A Current Affair. Welcome to A Current Affair. Welcome to A Current Affair. I'm Tracy Grimshaw. Live from Buckingham Palace, we take you to Bermuda from Quebec City in Canada. Coming to you from guess where? Hollywood. Tonight it is a very special edition of the program. I've been doing A Current Affair for 17 years this year um, and I think I understand it pretty well now and I think I understand our audience pretty well now and I see it as the people's show. Um, it's not my show, despite the fact that I host it and I've worked on it for so long. It, it's not our show in the office, it's our viewers' show. And we listen really hard to what our viewers tell us that they're interested in and that they want. Um, and I think we give people a voice. I, I think that ACCA is the people's show and I think it, it helps people to, to have a voice. At approximately 9.30 last night, a rockfall occurred at the Beaconsfield Gold Mine. Did you have any sense on that day that it was not an ordinary day? Did you have a no. sixth sense? It sounded pretty good to me. No, look, it's just, yeah, it's just no. a normal, normal day's work, you know, like we just had the same duties as what we normally do. All right, so you're both in the cage. Larry's on the ground, he's passing things to you. Yep. It was just quiet as any other normal day. Actually, it was really good, actually. It was, it was. <laughs> Bloody magnificent. Because <laughs> normally there's something, something going on, you know, like... So, yeah. what happened? I turned around to grab my water bottle, and as far as I know, Brent lit up a smoke. Yeah. I had um, my head at the time. Mm. And uh, all, I, all I recall then is just this almighty crack and, and wind blast percussion. The wind, the wind blast was the mate. Well, that's all I used to remember is the wind blast. It was, um, it was something else. Yeah, it? like just a it was, almighty it was... crack and the blast. It uh, <clears throat> actually pushed me around into a fetal position, like, you know, curled up in a ball. Um, in the cage? In the cage itself, um, with quite a substantial amount of rock, you know, mm. like equivalent to probably three quarters of a tonne of rock. At that stage, I, um, I yelled for Larry uh, to get us out several times, three or four times I, I was screaming screaming for Larry to get us out. Uh, at that stage, there was no answer from Larry. I then uh, I called upon Brandt um, several times. Uh, I believe myself that um, Brandt may have been knocked unconscious for a, uh, a small amount of time. Um, I called I called again probably two or three times, and then uh, Brandt here answered me. Um, I said to Brandt, are you right, are you right? He said, yeah, he said, I can't move my legs. He said, my legs are pinned. I said, yep. I said, I'm in the same boat, mate. I said, I've got a lot of rock on me. How much rock is on you? Are you, are you buried under I, this? I was, he was completely buried. Brent and I wouldn't have been as far apart as what we are now. No. Uh, well, Brent couldn't even see maybe, me. Maybe I was, you know, there'd been a couple yeah. of feet between us, like in front of us. Yeah. But I couldn't see him. I was buried. And the more I tried to get myself out, the more it packed around me and it, was, and it was taking my breath away. It was putting pressure on me. And I got to the stage where I, I was, I was down to, uh, very shallow breaths. Yeah, very shallow breaths, which is getting towards my last last breaths. And uh, you, you, you felt that they were your last breaths. Yeah, I was getting. Well, you stopped shouting. I was down. You know, uh, all I could do was just say, "Well, look, buddy, we've got to hold on because I've got to get out to help you." Just imagine, I could just see the the picture of the wife mm. and the three children, and uh, I said to myself, "I'm not dying here." I said, no, I'm not dying here. This take a bit more and a bit of rock to stop me. And I look, I'll tell you, Tracy, I've had a few blues in my life, I said, but I've never fought that hard. With Todd disabled, Brand spent the next three days clawing out a tunnel. He estimates that he'd dug around five and a half metres through the fallen rock, but there was no way out. Did you wonder about Larry? While all of this is going on. Actually, yeah, we did. We thought Larry got away. Yeah, we thought Larry may have got out. The whole time, um, we said, oh, it's all right, you know, Larry will get us help, you know, like he's got away. The men remember it as around days four, five and six, a series of explosions that with every blast came closer to them and closer, they believed, to killing them. Each time they'd fire, <laughs> we'd look at Brant. 
with the shake hands. Yeah. There's another one, mate. <laughs> but each time they fired... What, you mean you'd shake hands and congratulate yep. each other on surviving? Yep. Yeah. Surviving another yeah. firing. Another one, yeah. Can you tell me about the letters that you wrote to the family? I wrote letters to the wife and he just explained to her how hard I'm fighting and how hard I fought and, and, and that, how much I loved her and, 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 and all that. And uh, there was letters that uh, uh, I wrote to my youngest youngest son, Liam, <coughs> who's a, um, a pretty keen footballer. And, uh, Were you yeah. writing letters to Rachel? Oh, yeah, I had a smoke packet and the sticker had actually worn off and it was just the reflective stuff, so, yeah, I wrote on that, yeah. I guess I was saying, I was, I was writing a letter to my youngest fellow who's, who's a pretty keen footballer. And I uh, I just wrote to, a letter to him saying that, you know, look, that Dad loves you and uh, that uh, if everything turns out in your football career that uh, I'm going to be there watching over him and... I can't imagine how hard it must have been for, for that was, you two. That was the hardest part of the ordeal, I think, was writing them letters to the loved yeah, ones at and, home. And talking about your family. And talking about yeah, your family. We had, we had, the only common ground we had was family. In the first days after the cave-in, there were continuing earth tremors. Did you think that there could be a fall and that your legs could be Well, that pinned? was one of the concerns that was for me, because I had no boots. <laughs> but, um, but that was our thought right from day one. So we had a, st a sharp Stanley knife blade in our Stanley knives because Brant and I, we were prepared to take our leg off if we had to, to have ourselves freed. Are you serious? You discussed cutting your legs off? Yep. Yeah. We went through a lot of um, contingency plans. <laughs> yeah, no, we'd actually discussed yeah. that if, if we had to come to that conclusion, our leg had to come off because it was pinned and it was going to be a risk for us. <laughs> We were prepared to take our leg off with yeah, the Stanley knife. We'd gone through where we we're going to get the material for tornadoes and and everything else. So we planned it. Um, we had to sort of plan things like that for peace of mind. And I actually made the quote to Brant: "If um, if we can come out of this, if I can come out of this losing a leg be and go back to my loved ones, I'll, I'll be more than happy." I wasn't happy with that. We had very limited water. Yep. We had a drip, drip. We and stripped our helmets out. Took all the insides out of our helmet. We had one helmet sitting under the drip at a time. Right. We had so, give it you know, a period of time it would yeah. fill up. We'd take the full one out, put the empty one up, so we actually had water all the time. So by the time we finished drinking the, the first one, the second one would be full. Their worst fear is that an effort to free them could actually end up killing them. And while they're thinking this, the mind begins to blast a tunnel through to where the men may be. So you think that they're going to kill you, try to get into you? No, we thought they were coming to get us, but we just didn't know if we'd be alive when they got there. No when to walk away, no when to run, you never... Around about 7 o'clock tonight, we got reports that the two men may have been found alive, that there were people walking literally through the main street here in Beaconsfield saying they're alive, they're alive, the miracle has happened. Yeah. The messages to your families and back, yeah. how much did they mean to you? Oh, oh. They meant a lot. Yeah. Yeah, no, look, yeah. the letters that the family them, wrote to us. Without them, it would have been half as good coming out. When did you get the news about Larry? Day eight. Day seven or eight. Day seven or eight, yeah. And, and so I asked the question, you know, um, is Larry at home, you know, with his wife and kids? And, and there was a really long pause and, and they, the answer come back, we're still looking, you know. And in the modern terms, that's not a really good scenario. They weren't still looking, though. They had found him. Mm. At what point did they tell you that they had found him? The next him? day. Is that because you said, be honest with uh, us? Yeah. Yeah, we said, look, you know, you've got to be up front with us and we'll be up front with you, this you know. This is about day eight. We've got to be, you know, look, we don't know lies, you know. We're big, big boys, we can handle the truth, you know. And welcome to our continuing coverage of the Beaconsfield Mine Rescue and it appears the long wait will soon be over for Todd Russell and Brant Webb. Uh, there is increasing confidence that after 14 nights trapped underground, Todd and Brant will be brought to the surface within the next few hours. Yeah. We actually said to the paramedics, look, we're going to walk out of here 
One way or another. When you were saying that you insisted on walking out, were you 100% sure you'd yep. be able to walk? Oh, yeah, we knew we were going to, we were going to walk. If even if they had to strap boards to our legs, you know. We were going to walk out. <laughs> so we, walk, we walked into that cage to go underground. We were going to walk out to tag off. What was it like the first time you stood? Very, very, very Actually, funny in the legs. Yeah, it was like jelly. But we didn't tell the paramedics that. No. We said they were rocks at Gibraltar, mate. And then we, it, was, it, was, it was solid as rock. <laughs> <laughs> solid as rock. We all went once and stopped. That's when we opened the door and... We freedom. Came, came out to freedom and... And all that, that just to see that man of people standing there, and, and that was it was mind blowing, you know. Here they come! Here they come! There it is. It's true. They're back. Oh my goodness! Look at them. They're walking. They've taken They're the dead. tags. <laughs> They've clocked off. They're going to clock off, aren't they? To hold them, and that is, is fantastic. It's something that we hadn't felt for such a long time, for 14 days, not hearing their voice or. You know, not even be able to give them a kiss and, and a cuddle and, and tell them you love them, it's just, unless you wrote it down. Like, it's, it's the difference in writing it and telling them you love them, it's, it's a lot of difference, you know. You're, you're more aware of, you're, you're not immortal anymore. You know, you're, you're, you're not, you know, five foot eleven and bulletproof. I think Tracy is something that, that can heal, but I, I feel it's going to be quite a period of time before it does heal, because the memories are always going to be there. Mm. What did you learn about each other down there? Oh, it's about everything. Our strengths. <laughs> Our strengths. Our weaknesses. <laughs> I was going to miss all this, I thought, but it's bloody great to have you back, son. I just got one other thing I'd like to say to the Australian public, Trace, that whatever they got at home, their loved ones, don't take them for granted, you know, because once you lose it, it's gone forever. I have very often been the person at home yelling questions at the television set. You know, I, I love interviewing and I, I watch other people's interviews and I feel like it's my job when I do an interview to ask the questions that I'd be yelling at the television set if I was sitting in my living room. I feel like I, you know, I am the, the voice of our viewers, if you like, and I feel like I should say what, what they're thinking and I feel like I should ask what they want the answers to. And I think then people feel like they've been heard and seen and noticed and that their priorities are our priorities. Now, I think that's my job. Don, thanks for your time. You've been described today as a psychotic bully, a misogynist and a sexual predator, among other very serious allegations. What do you say? I think I got a bit to apologise to, to, to my family and um, also to the people that supported Burke's backyard. There are things I've done that I'm not at all proud of. Um, prior to Maria's ill health, I had a number of affairs, which I should never have done, and I think I let everybody down. When you say that you've had a number of affairs, are you suggesting that uh, some of these allegations uh, relate to those? Well, why, why do you say... Because having affairs doesn't make you a sexual predator or a bully. Uh, having affairs is between you and your wife. So how does that relate to what has been said about you today? I might have set up a view from some of our staff that I wasn't a nice person, perhaps. Do you think you weren't a nice person? Towards the end, I don't think I was a very good person. Did you say to Bridget Nanessa, producer, that uh, on a trip to Greece, that if anything went wrong on that trip, that you were going to rip her head off and <laughs> down her throat? No, and I never said anything remotely like that to anyone I've ever worked with or anyone I know. And furthermore, anybody that does say that should be run out of town on a rail. It's despicable. She says she's still traumatised by it to this day. Well, maybe. She's a very tough lady, that one, and, and we did have issues with her. She did leave... Um, not under good terms. She said that she was demoted after you called a young researcher a dumb slut and she stood up to defend that young researcher. No, it never happened. Um, Louise Langdon, who said that you tried to remove her top on a work trip, that you actually literally poured her and tried to remove her top and tried to remove an item of her clothing on a work trip. Is that the sort of thing you would have done? Would I you would have never... done that even joking? 
I don't think so. I mean, I don't remember doing it. I certainly wouldn't have done it seriously. It may be that people at the time didn't feel empowered to do anything about you then. You were the boss. They were reliant on you for their job, their salary. Yeah, it was a robust exchange there. We were all in prime time. It's like being part of the Australian cricket team or whatever. You've got to win. If you've got one or two weak people, it's a real problem. I've worked in television for 36 years and most of them in prime time and it's been robust and no one's ever showed me a donkey bestiality video or, or tried to pull my bra off mm. or... Well, I've never actually seen a donkey bestiality video. I've never owned one and I would never show one to anyone. Um, so I don't... Look, whether these things over time because they feel hurt or angry or whatever, whether they've sort of grown in the telling when they meet some of these people after leaving us or whatever, I don't know. What about young Wendy Dent, who was a, a fairy, and a kid's fairy character, mm. who had aspirations to be an actress? She said that you asked her to audition topless to be a mermaid on the show. I was talking to my daughter this morning and she said, well, you know, your sense of humour at times, you know, I've seen people all, you know, roll their eyes a bit, and I went... But I don't know is the answer. I, she said it remotely could have said something close to that, but I don't remember saying it. Would your sense of humour have run to saying to a young TV writer that she looked like she'd be a demon and no. what sexual positions did she like? No. And what sort of an idiot would say that? Like, to what end would anyone say that? Why would all these women make this up, Don? Well, I'm guessing it's, it's, it's the social media, the Twittersphere thing. I guess they've stirred this up, there's the Harvey Weinstein thing, and we've got a witch hunt. I'm prepared to cop the fact that I might have terrified a few people or whatever and, and so on, um, and that I shouldn't have done that and so on. But these sort of things bear no relationship to who I am and what I'm about. We heard an account this morning from a woman uh, called Julie Nielsen, and when you walked into her house, she opened the door and you said, I, could, I bet you could shock a bad boy, do you take it up Never. Never anything like that, nor would I. But I don't We've know... We've heard that from the crew. I didn't say it. Yeah. Well, so the crew's lying... Well, you say the three crew, women who... there was a problem with the crew, and, and I don't want to go into that because of some fragilities of the people involved, but no, I never said that. There are a lot of people lying here. If you've never said it, Don, yeah, there are a lot of people lying. But if you say that you were not a good guy, you know, if you say that you, you know, you understand that you weren't a good guy, you were a bear mm. with a sore head, you had a quirky mm. sense of humour, mm. if you admit all of these things, how can you admit all of those things and then say categorically all of these things could never have happened when all I... of these women are saying it, and, and men? Yeah, I know what I would say and what I did say and what I didn't. I don't remember every event, but I don't say things like that. I don't understand why they have said these things. Now is the time care. to say what you have to say. My ethics are such that I am not going to, if people are fragile uh, and saying things could damage their mental health or their careers, uh, sorry, I'd rather take the dive. So are you saying that all of these women who've identified themselves and a couple who haven't identified themselves are fragile and this is not coming all. from their fragility? Not all. Or, uh, some of them were incredibly robust. Um, but I think also this whole Weinstein thing, one of the things it does is to reinforce the victim mentality in women. Do you, do you see the whole Me Too campaign post Weinstein as, as making, t turning women into victims? Because it seems to be very empowering. It reinforces a bit of fear and so on in their victim position. You look at the people who have lined up against you today, there are three women who've put their names to it, two women who haven't. There's the Newcastle incident. There are three executives from Channel 9, two former CEOs. Hmm. That's a, where there's smoke, there's fire, and that's a lot of fire. Yeah, well, I gave you the fire. Um, the rest of it is just smoke. I was told a story years ago by a producer about you who said that you had said that you were a geneticist and you were interested in genetics, and you said that if you reproduced with this young family member, uh, the baby that would be produced would have the perfect gene pool. Uh, for a start, I... I I'm an Asperger's person um, and I have a lot of other failings uh, that are genetic and the reason I mention that is genetic. Um, no, uh, I don't believe that for me, but I would never say anything. That's just disgusting. You've never before said that you've got Asperger's. No, and I haven't been medically diagnosed, but I've worked it out that that's what, what I've got. And, and, but a lot of those words, I think, have just grown over the years. Or whatever. Remember, this is 30 years ago, a lot of this. 
Who remembers exactly what happened 30 years ago? Does it make it inaccurate if it's 30 years ago? Robert Hughes went to jail for um, crimes that he committed 25 years ago. Yeah, and if that's the case, he should. But um, I, you know, I think with time, I can't remember exact things I did 20 years ago or whatever. If you can't remember what you did 25 or 30 years ago, maybe you did these things. Well, I said to you before that, uh, firstly, a lot of them I cannot remember at all. You, you, know, you know who you are. And, and, you know, just because somebody says it doesn't entirely mean that it's 100% hunky-dory. But I don't want to go in and pick them out one by one and perhaps go over grievances or whatever because I think that is an evil in itself. OK. All right. Thanks. Thanks, John. Do you think I'm going to stop fighting for the Australian people that are, I see... I see farmers that have been forced off the land as kids, no hope of future. And people are, are hoping and praying that I'm going to be the voice for them. And I cop all this shit all the time and I'm sick of it. Absolutely sick of it. Kevin Rudd goes to a... He goes to a strip joint. You've got Craig Thompson using the credit card of the, of the um, unions in a brothel. You've had corruption, you've had any obedience, you'd have pedophiles, you'd had everything. But they just sail through it. No, let's let's give Paul in the hands and kick in the guts. Have you said this to Steve Dixon? Have you said this to him? Did you say this to him last night? You'd have been entitled to? No, I didn't. Why not? He's bashing himself around enough. You have no idea, and I'm concerned for that man too. I've copped it more than once. And I keep getting up and I'll have another go. Why are you still in it? Look at you. Why don't you walk? I mean, look at what, look at what it's doing to you. There's one thing I have to ask you that you're not going to like, but do you think that you are ever... Ask it. <laughs> do you think that you will ever manage to convince people that you are not Prince Harry's father? I don't know. Because it's a... You're going to persist on this, aren't you? <laughs> Well, it's just such a hard thing to put to rest, isn't it? If I've been trying to put to rest all sorts of things, and, uh, um, you know, some ways I've been right and some ways I've been wrong. Hopefully, the majority have been right. You know, I don't know if, if, it, if it's worked. We'll see in a few years. Whenever I go into an interview, I, I have a good think about what this interview needs to be and what is the information that I need to explore in that interview. Uh, and then you have to back your own judgment. Um, you don't do it looking for accolades. I, I, I never do. Um, and so I don't look for feedback. It's not a motivation for me. In the late afternoon sun at Uluru, Lindy Chamberlain Creighton has returned to the rock back to where everything changed so dramatically on that cold August night. When you do think back to that night, is there anything that you would have done differently? I wish I'd slept whole three kids in the car, like we had done on another night on the same trip. These few square metres are ground zero for what would become Australia's most famous legal saga. Right about here, the barbecue area where Michael Chamberlain and another camper would hear Azaria's last cry. Just over here, past this scrub now grown three decades higher, there, the family car where police would argue Lindy Chamberlain killed her baby. Right next to it, the tent where Lindy saw the dingo emerge. For the next several years, 
all the debate centred on what happened here in this space. Sleeping Regan, which, which way is his head? Facing that way. Well, actually, his head was here and we actually had suitcases or something in there. And then Azaria's carry basket there. Can you tell me if it, this gets too much? Which end was Azaria's head? Here. OK. So where you are, that's the barbecue yeah. enclosure area? Yeah. How far away were you when you saw the dingo come out? There. But the bushes... But by then, I, you know, within that to that, I'd gone from walking to a sprint. So it wasn't until I was at an angle where I could see over the top that I could see in and see Regan and, and see that the tent had been trashed and, and all her blankets. Scattered. So of course I dived in and started searching under the blankets and my hands were occupied so I used my foot to poke him. To give Regan a poke? To make sure he was all right. Do you need a hug? <laughs> and he, he played dead because he, he thought it would come back to get him. When you were sort of here, coming back to the tent, where was Aidan? Behind me. In fact, I didn't even know he was there at that stage. Now I can, I can see he's upset now. But I know he was standing behind the tent when Judy West... Shone her to her chin. She came and asked him if it was true that the dingo had taken her. And he just turned around and told her the dingo had his baby in its stomach. Look, if you want to take a break, we can do that. <laughs> Does it make it any easier? No. <laughs> it seemed that everything that happened over the next several years came down to those few minutes when you and Aidan took Azaria back to the tent to put her to bed for the night and Aidan wanted something else to eat. Yeah. It was as simple as that. Have you played that over in your mind many times over the years? Um, I can just shut my eyes and see it like a movie. But I mean, if he hadn't wanted to something to eat, he'd be in the tent too and awake. And they say if you say something and give the dingoes a fright, they can attack. I could have lost three children that night. It could have been worse. For the Chamberlains, the nightmare was only just beginning. I just yelled. I, uh, there wasn't time to go and tell people. I just yelled out, has anyone got a torch? The dingo's got my baby. Six months later, the first coronial inquiry ruled that a dingo had taken Azaria, but there had been human intervention in disposing of her body. I was told if I said I was guilty, I could go home. Were you ever tempted to accept that deal just to make it go away? No. Why should my family, knowing I'm innocent, live with the fact that everybody says, your mother's a murderer? I wouldn't do that to my family. Michael Chamberlain has no doubt what was driving the case. I think we were seen to be the patsies. You've got to get somebody, get a conviction, because you can't have dingoes running around killing kids or the fear of that happening. Dispel it. Get rid of it. Do you ever wonder what your life would be like today if Azaria had not been taken that night? I, I wonder sometimes what my life with her would have been like. But life in general, no, I tend to as much as possible take off the rear view mirrors and go to the front. I bought this tie especially for you. Very nice. It's fetching. Fetching, huh? <laughs> that is a terrible word. <laughs> fetching. I mean, that's nothing, is it? Welcome back, Sir Michael. Thank you. Welcome <laughs> back, I told you. <laughs> is it good to be in your second home? Do you have any little rituals that you do when you get here so that you settle in? Uh, no, I, I settle in straight away. I mean, somebody asked me today what I liked about Australia when I first arrived here. 
And what I liked about Australia was I never had to think, do I like it or not? From the very moment I arrived here, I enjoyed it. I've been in television for 41 years now and there have been massive technological changes. You know, we, we didn't have computers when I started. We didn't have mobile phones when I started. You know, we had pages and I'd have to find a public phone box to, you know, to call the chief of staff. Um, so technology has changed immeasurably in, in you know, 41 years. Uh, but the things that stay the same about information gathering and disseminating information, which is you know, that's our job as journalists, is that you, you have to be trustworthy. And that's a real pact that you have with viewers. It was an unthinkable act of betrayal committed in the most unlikely setting. This nondescript home in this unassuming country town was the heart of Shelley Walsh's family, where her kids were loved and nurtured over years of Christmases and birthdays, and where in a few hours of madness, her father would destroy all their lives. John Walsh was still battling depression when Shelley moved to Cowra following the breakup of her marriage. A single mum juggling a career as a police officer, she relied on her parents for help. Did your dad like looking after your kids? He gave the impression he did. I can remember like the kids sitting on his lap reading to him and singing like Jamie would sing to him. You know, they loved him and he loved him. What was your father like that night? There was a couple of things that made me just go, ooh, you're in a bad mood, but apart from that, normal. What things can you remember? Can you tell me? I remember walking down the hallway going, have a good day at school, and Dad yelling out, no, they won't. But at the time, I didn't think anything of it, because that's just Dad. All of these things, I guess, sound red flashing warning signs to you now. Mm-hmm. With 2020 hindsight, yes. OK, so you leave there that night and you go home and you go to work mm -hmm. and then what? Um, I re remember trying to ring mum, it was about 7.30 in the morning and I remember looking at the clock and going yep they should all be awake now because the kids will be having breakfast before school and, and the phone rang out no one answered it. 69 year old John Walsh had just committed mass murder he killed his wife, bludgeoning her with a hammer and stabbing her with a knife. He beat his seven-year-old grandson, Kevin, to death with a blunt object. And he drowned Kevin's five-year-old sister, Jamie, in the bath. Just as you go in the front door, the first door on the right is mum and dad's bedroom. I noticed that the, the latch was on from the outside. I remember thinking, well, Mum can't lock herself in the room if she's inside the room. So I unlatched it and opened it and saw Mum on the floor. But I remember saying to Dad, the first thing I said to him was like, did I say what I think I've just seen? And he jumped because he didn't even know I was in the house. He hadn't registered that I had come home. And um, he just said, what did you just say? And I said, Mum lying on the floor. And then he started going, oh, do you want a cup of tea? Just right back to business, like right back to normal stuff. And I've just gone, yeah, OK. Were you afraid at that point? What, what were you thinking? At this point, I knew something wasn't right, but I was just trying to find out what it was. I turned around to him while we were in there and I said, Dad, I have to ask you a question. And he's just gone, what? I said, is Mum dead? He went, oh, no, don't be stupid. What? And I'm sort of thinking, oh, OK. And I started shaking. And then he's going, oh, come in the living room and have a chat with me. And I, OK. I followed him in with the cup of tea. And as we go into the living room, he picks up this axe off the table. And that's when I notice that the kids' school uniforms are still there. And that's when I've said to Dad, well, Dad, that's the kids' school uniforms. Like, what are they wearing at school? And he's just gone, oh, I think I can hear your mum, and jumped up and walked out of the room, like, really quick. He's turned right to head towards mum and dad's bedroom. I've kept going straight, straight up to the kids' room, going, if they're not at school, they've got to be in here. Were you afraid as you opened that door? I don't think I was actually thinking at that stage. I just wanted to 
open that door and see if the kids were there and see if they were all right. As soon as I opened the door, first thing I saw was Jamie. She was lying in the bed. She still had her pyjamas on. And I knew when I looked at her that she wasn't alive. Um, so like she'd, he'd set her up to look like she was sleeping. Then I heard his footsteps behind me. And I've turned around and he's just standing there looking at me, like not moving, just watching me. And he's holding the axe. It's, it's like the second I saw Jamie, suddenly whatever I'd blocked with mum came back. It was like, Jamie's gone, mum's gone. And I'm looking at this axe going, I'm next. Could you see Kevin? I actually looked on the top bunk for Kevin. He wasn't there. Um, and on the bed Jamie was on, there was a uh, rolled up blanket next to her. I just thought it was a bunched up quilt. Uh, I found out later on that Kevin was in there. And I remember leaning down and putting my hand on Jamie's cheek to see if like, she was still warm, because then maybe I could bring her back. <laughs> she was cold. And um, it was while I was doing that that he's come in with the axe and hit me. And the first one's gone in down there. I fell down to both knees. As I was falling, he's come in for the second hit, which hit up there. And then he's raised it again to go for number three. Um, and as it was coming down for the third one, I managed to grab hold of the axe and use that to pull myself back up so that we're both just standing there facing each other. And I just look at him and I went, why? He said, what have you done and why? He goes, I'm doing this because I love you. When I'm done with you lot, I'm going to go to Newcastle and do your ex-husband. We're all better off this way. This is just how it has to be. The next thing I remember is that we're both still holding the axe and I've got him on the ground and he's just looking at me and I remember, never forget the look in his eyes, he's absolutely terrified. Because at that point he knew I was in control because I had him on the ground. And I remember weighing it up, going, I can't handcuff you because I've got no handcuffs. Um, I could take the axe. You have anything to say, John? In August this year, John Walsh received two life sentences for the murders of his grandchildren, 15 years for murdering his wife, and at least 12 years for the attempted murder of his daughter. Did that give you a measure of satisfaction to face him in court? That actually helped a lot because I finally got to tell him what I thought of him and what he did. Now I can't get my mum back and I can't get my kids back but I can still get out there and do the best I can for them. You went to see him in jail. That must have been excruciating to do. He just goes, if you're here looking for like a reason why, I don't have anything to offer. At the end of that visit, I don't think I've ever been that angry in my life. Obviously, you want to know why. I mean, that's an obvious question, mm -hmm. isn't it? Do you have any ideas? Is there any possible reason that he could give me in the whole world where I'm going to go, oh, I get it now? No. So it, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because there's nothing he can say that's going to be an explanation. Finally, 14 months on, Shelley is able to look to the future. She wants to demolish the house in which her loved ones died. And in the next few months, she plans to return to work can't get my mum back and I can't get my kids back but everything else in my life I can get back and will get back and the more I do the less he has because if I give in to it and let it bait me he wins and he's taken enough. A Current Affair was presented by Michael Willisey and he used to do those, he used to light a fire under politicians each night and I'd think that's fantastic, <laughs> he's fantastic. Um, I never one day thought that I would sit in that chair. Prime Minister, you said at uh, your launch on Sunday, I saved the country. 
You don't hold a hose, you weren't in your tinny plucking people off rooftops, you weren't doing 16 hour days in PPE on COVID wards, you didn't get enough vaccines soon enough, you didn't get enough rats so that we could finally have a holiday interstate for Christmas and China is set up base in the Solomons. Do you think maybe you slightly over egged the part about I saved the country? Well, that's, that's quite a long list you've been able to pull together. So I think news is important. Uh, I think it helps people to understand the place, the world we live in. It helps people to understand other people. It helps them to understand other people's motivations and other people's actions. Um, sometimes it just makes you grateful to live your own life rather than be living the life of some poor unfortunate person you've just heard about on the news. So um, I, I love information and I think that's why I do this job and why I've done it for so long. He's very good at the games. He can jump. He and looks lovely. Me. Yes. I ride with these horses with the quadriplegics. I get on behind them and away we go. It's a joyous mm, thing, isn't it? Yes. What a great gift. Mm. It's but, fabulous uh, work. Melissa Henry is one remarkable woman, dedicating most of her 75 years to helping others. Here on this property in a suburb of Perth, miracles happen. And how did you find your way to this remarkable place? Quite by accident. I had two ponies down here. And one day, um, a, a boy with polio and another girl with cerebral palsy turned up with their parents and said, can we pat the ponies? I said, of course, why don't we put you on? And I said, come on, we'll get on the horse. The horse will get used to you. And it's amazing. Yes. And so what did that teach you? Don't look at the disability, just keep everybody the same. Everybody is a person. So just treat them as you see them and away you go. Watching her in action, you can see she's determined to get everyone in the saddle. Okay, what did you say to Apple? Give him a hug. Robin Mainwaring was diagnosed with Alzheimer's three years ago. When you're riding, you can never not concentrate. And is that important to you, the, the thinking? Yes, yes. Yeah, it keeps your mind working, ticking over. Use it or lose it, is yes, that the theory? Yes, ab absolutely. <laughs> 46-year-old Sarah Can has an intellectual disability, cerebral palsy and neurofibromatosis. Not letting any one of those challenges hold her back, she's competed all over the world in Special Olympics. How many years have you been here, Sarah? I've been here since I've been five years old and I'm 48 now. Oh my goodness. So you've been here for almost as long as Melissa's been here. Yeah. Is Sarah your longest term student? Probably not. Really? <laughs> yes. Really? Wow. Yes. But we've had a lot of people down here for a long time. Long, long as school of life. Well, yes. it is. Does it make you feel proud to, to, to watch someone like Sarah blossom? Oh, yes. Yes, I, I treat her really as my own. Perfect. When you're ready now, Prepare to trot and go forward. Yeah, forward into trot. Super, keep trotting. Is this one of the girls who wasn't very verbal when she first started here? Exactly, <laughs> correct. So I'm quite amazed that she's actually <laughs> speaking <laughs> and speaking to the, the camera and everybody else around. Yeah, I'm a big fan of this. Well done, Tracy. <laughs> Got her to speak. It wasn't me. I think she just wanted to. I think you got her to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone ever turned up and you've thought, I, I can't do this, I, there, there's no way we'll be able to get you riding? I don't think so. I, I do have a problem with uh, weight occasionally of the younger people now. There's little girls that are 170 kilos and that's why we have to have the bigger horses. So that's the only restriction you set? I mean, other physical issues, physical disabilities, intellectual disabilities, you think we can get over that? I feel that we can get over that, even if they're really difficult and if they really are naughty and autistic and they bite you and all those things, I think that's the challenge for me, to stop the biting and start the speaking. 
Yes. <laughs> is that what keeps you coming back? What, what keeps me coming back? Well, first of all, the horses. And then, yes, I want everybody to improve a little bit in their life. Everybody else is going to stand up in the saddle. Do you find that the horses sort of calibrate themselves according to the ability of the person on their back? Absolutely, absolutely. They change for everybody and everybody's aura as well. What have you learned about people in the 46 years that you've been here? It's quite easy to get frustrated and angry with some people that don't accept everything that's going on. So I've got up in the morning and I feel that we must be kind. You have to be kind to everybody. Everybody wants to enjoy life. And if you can give something else more than enjoyment or even a physical activity that they can't do, that's what it's all about. The reward is that at least you've got a smile. It's a smile in your heart as well. Yeah. It's life, it's about life. Better life. Me and Mum always say, like, I wish there was 10 more years with you and we can just feel Daddy saying, what if it was 10 years ago when I died? And then we think, yeah, I don't think... We're lucky. Yeah, we're really lucky that we could have um, that long with him. Does it make you feel better to watch diaries? Daddy on TV? Yeah, it does. It makes you feel like he's still there and he's, he's, he's really watching over you and it makes you feel like, ooh, that's my Daddy and I love him very much. And here they are. Give them a big welcome to Harry. Harry, you're about to say something. I think um, kind of just how amazing the fans have been kind of is what drives us to do more. So I know from Porsche this is like a big show in Australia, so thank you for being here. Whoa, this is my story. How does she know my story? Thank you. It's been so nice to meet you. I would have thought that they would be beating down your door. I'm waiting for them to come and knock on my door. <laughs> oh, you hope you're shooting, because this is very good. Oh. <laughs> but I think we should, are we shooting? Good. Has the insecurity gone away with, with the wisdom of age and maybe the, you know, the I love of a good man? I hate to disappoint you, but no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are you more like Sandy 1 or Sandy 2? I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> How do you cope now? You described it as King Kong's mother when you feel like you're having a... <laughs> what are you talking about, eh? <laughs> I'm more control now. I can laugh at it now. Couldn't do that before. you got to stop for one second because you've got to do the lipstick oh. on your teeth and I don't want to let you go on like that. <laughs> Fixed. Good woman. <laughs> Sisters. Sister, that's that's right. how it works. I believe that knowledge is armour. I believe that knowing what's going to happen is empowering. I don't like surprises. <laughs> I like to know what's going to happen. I like to know why it's happening. I like to know who's doing it. And I think most people feel the same way. I mean, I think you're far better to go through life knowing what's going to happen rather than, you know, being ambushed by it. I think sometimes you just have to put your phone down. The world won't stop if you put your phone down. Thank you, Tracy Grimshaw. Where would I be without you? I'd be hiring dodgy tradies. For the laughs. <laughs> for the tears. We hope that we've given you, you know, a bright future. For informing. Thanks, Tracy. You've been an absolute trooper. And for always caring. Here's exactly why exemptions exist. Here's looking at you, kid. But the party is not over yet. Join us for Tracy's final episode of A Current Affair. That exclusive story is tomorrow night. We look forward to your company then. Good night. <laughs>